Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you have not, if you would, open your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 2. We're walking through that letter, and we come to Philippians 2, 12 through 18. We may all have encountered or know of individuals who have, they've grown up in the church. And when they leave home, they go absolutely buck wild. These are people who, they were active in their youth group. They, they went to the church functions and maybe even took part in, in leading the services. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's a sibling. Or it may be that just maybe this person might be or have been you. The person who has exhibited the character of Christ. Who's walked in the light. And yet now, for some reason is exhibiting behavior so contrary to Christ. Why have these people chosen to behave out of that character, out of the character that we saw them participate in and possess? What's missing? What happened? Why are they not displaying the mind of Christ? Well, perhaps... Perhaps it's because they have not worked out their own salvation. Paul has this concern for the Philippians. Verses two, uh, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, my dear friends, my brothers and sisters, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And Paul begins to give the Philippians application to the example of Christ that he has just finished in verses 5 through 11. The Christ hymn. Christ embodied the, the message of obedience, of humility, of self-sacrifice, and now Paul applies the force of that example to the Philippians. Hence, the therefore. This section is tied to the previous section. Because Christ was what he was, therefore, you do this. Paul praises the Philippians, he admonishes them, and he charges them and gives them hope. He praises them for past obedience. He charges them to continue in obedience. And he admonishes them to work out their own salvation. And gives them hope that they don't have to do it by themselves. They don't do it on their own. They do it and are able to do it because it is God working in them. He praises them for their their past obedience. He brings to mind their, their initial obedience when Paul first brought the gospel to Philippi and how they obeyed and how they've been obeying. He's heard good things about Philippi. And he wants them to continue that. As that memory is brought to the forefront, he charges and admonishes them much more in my absence. Continue to obey and work out your own salvation. Why does Paul bring up again his presence or absence? The, he's talking about being Christ-like, about completing their salvation, making it full and complete. That's the point of the passage here. Work out your own salvation. And there's a little bit of debate about his bringing this up. Now I think this is more than just mentioning his presence or absence in passing. It's the second time he's, he's had this thought in the letter. 
It's stronger here. This is a stronger statement than what appears in 127 where the whether I come or not becomes much more in my absence. There's no question that Paul's physical presence made a difference in the life of the church. If we had an apostle here, I know there would be some differences. We would make sure that we put our best foot forward. We would make sure that we do the day-to-day living like we ought to do. Why? Because if not, the apostle Paul is going to write us one of these letters that we don't want to get. That we know he has written. So it would definitely make, have an effect on the lives of the Philippians, their church lives, their day-to-day lives, if he was presently, physically there. It has at least some bearing on the Philippians working out their own salvation. What Paul is saying is, is basically, you obeyed while I was with you. But now I'm absent. And being absent, it's, it's harder for you to obey. It's more difficult. I'm not physically present with you to give you that sustaining encouragement. And it's going to be harder for you to obey. You need to work out your own salvation. And so the question is, work out your own salvation. Is it you Or is it y'all? Is it the collective corporate Christian community? Do we work out our own salvation as the church here in Nikiski or wherever? Is it the Philippian church working out its salvation or is it the individual Christians in Philippi? And there's a big debate. Either whether or not Paul's talking about corporate salvation or individual salvation. And the language here is plural. plural. It is you all. You plural. And a lot of people use that to make the case that Paul is talking not about personal salvation, but about the salvation of the Christian community as a whole. And there is something to be said about Christian community, corporate salvation. But... That's not the focus of our discussion, and we'll save that for a later time. The letter is addressed to a plural audience, so of course Paul's going to use plural language. These plural commands, these plural admonitions that Paul is giving to the church at Philippi, They can only be carried out on an individual basis. Each one of them doing this brings out the plural of the church at Philippi. They must take these commands, these admonitions, and they apply them to their individual lives. And that is how a community of Christians work out their salvation by each of them individually following the humble example of Christ humble in obedience humble in counting others before themselves it's the example that Paul had just given them in verses 5 through 11 just what I told you about this is how you need to do it And we need to remember, you can't have a y'all without a bunch of you's. That's what y'all is. It's you all. You all. That's you singularly, you singularly, you singularly, and you singularly together make up you plural. You all. Y'all. That's what a community is. It's a bunch of individual Use gathered together in a common unity. People use 
Philippians 2 and 4. Let each of you look not only, not only at his own interest, but also at the interest of others. They use that to, to conclude that Paul is not talking about personal salvation because the verse tells us to not look only at our own interest. And if we're looking at our own interest, if we're looking at our own salvation, that's making us selfish. Question mark. Really? Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. I ain't been here for three months, but I want you to know I love every one of you, but I ain't trusting any of you for my salvation. And I hope none of you trust in me for your salvation, because that ain't going to get it. I can't make your calling and election sure, and you can't make my calling and election sure. This is individualness. Is it selfish to worry about making your calling and election sure? To speak of believers working out their personal salvation in their day-to-day -day living in no way denies that salvation is an act of God in precisely the same way that making your calling and election sure, uh, 2 Peter 1 and 10, does not suggest that election is our own act and not God's act. Personal sanctification takes place precisely in the context of the Christian community. The church at Philippi did have some community issues that they needed to work out. Could the Philippian community fix the issues between Yodi and Syntyche that we're going to get to later on? Could they fix that? Not without Euodia and Syntyche putting the example of Christ's humble obedience into personal practice. Not without them, Euodia and Syntyche, making the personal decision to let their own manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Not without them doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility counting others more significant than themselves. And not looking only to their own interest, but also the interests of others in their personal lives. Paul knew that his presence made a difference in the Philippian church. But he also knew that he must not tie their conduct, their obedience, directly to him, directly to his presence. They needed to have their anchor in Christ. Not Paul. So they needed to work out their own salvation. Now, some of you may be uh, familiar with Planet Fitness. There's like four of them up in Anchorage or something like that. It's a gym with a membership. Like 10 Fitness or anything else that you go, you pay your hard-earned money to somebody else to go work out. It's kind of weird to me now. It didn't because I used to be a member of Planet Fitness. Me and Julia both did. Um, and you got a membership card. Now, with the membership card, you get to bring a guest. We had the, the not the base, but the next up. So you, not only do you get to use all the equipment, but you get to use the tanning beds if you want to. You get to use the massage chairs, which, uh, buddy... I need one of them in the house. <laughs> Those are great. But see, you bring your buddy in with, with your membership card. You get a guest. But he don't get to use the massage chairs. Because he had not paid for the prescription. Or subscription, excuse me. And you can bring your buddy in. In an effort to get better physically uh, fit, more in shape. You can bring him in there, but if he don't use the equipment, he's not going to get in better shape. You can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. 
Working out your salvation is something that only you can do. Nobody can do it for you. We can both go to the gym together. But you can't make me in better shape if I don't use the equipment. Nobody can do it for you. Not your spouse, not your preacher, not your friend, not your siblings, not your kids, not your parents, not your friends, not even an apostle. You have to work out your own salvation. And some people might be thinking, wait a minute, that sounds like salvation by works. It's not. Trust me, it is not. That is not what I'm saying. And we need to be clear. No New Testament writer ever taught salvation by works. And no true New Testament teacher will teach that either. Work out does not mean work for. You can't do that. Well, then what does work out mean? What does it mean to work out your own salvation? Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and following... That salvation is by grace through faith. And that expression, through faith, concerns the essential human response to divine grace. Paul's work out is basically the same thing as his faith that works by love that he wrote about in Galatians 5 and 6. The entire scope of salvation necessarily includes the manifestation of righteousness in our lives. We cannot forget the association between not of works and for good works. Paul speaks about that in Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. And it's these good works that Paul has in mind here in Philippians when he says work out your own salvation. He means for them to put forth constant effort to be Christ-like. Now, in the original language, work out, that's one word, and it means to bring to full completion. It's kind of like a math problem. When you work out a math problem, you're not creating math. You're not producing math. You are working out a problem that you have been given. You're working it out to completion. Consider the musician. The composer has created the score. The melody. He's provided the notes and the timing. And he's done all the work. And he gives it to you. To hear that, you have to work it out. You go to the doctor and he says, man, you got problems. He gives you a diagnosis. He performs surgery and prescribes medication and physical therapy. Now you have to work it out. You have to take the meds. You have to show up for the, for the therapy. For the healing and recovery to be complete, there has to be cooperation with the operation. You don't simply sit back and let go and let God. It takes active effort on our part. That kind of sounds like Paul's talking about spiritual maturity. Well, he is. That's what working out your own salvation is. It's growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's going on to maturity. It's making that salvation complete. But he's not talking about spiritual growth in the broad sense that he does in other places. Here's Paul, here Paul's reference is to the specific area of humble obedience as displayed by Christ. You must actively pursue being Christ-like. Spiritual growth is not accidental. It is intentional. It is human cooperation with divine operation. It is working out, bringing to completion your salvation. Now, what about the uh, community? Well, personal salvation that we 
that we see here manifests itself in healthy community relationships. So it is your salvation collectively also. In this context, the believer's outworkings of personal salvation take the form of corporate community obligations within the Christian community. You can't work out somebody else's salvation for them. That's something that has to be done on the individual basis. But you can help others in their working out their salvation. You can be a source of encouragement. You can be a source of assistance in that. The work of the Christian carries the marks of obedience, responsibility, and sensitivity. It's obedience to God. It's responsibility to the work of being Christ-like. And it's sensitivity toward others that are trying to do the same thing in their lives. And now here's where Paul gives the Philippians hope. And here's, here's where he gives us hope. I have to work out my own salvation. Boy, how am I going to do that? Well, here's the hope. You don't have to do that. In fact, you can't do that. And you don't have to stress about it because there's hope. Paul says, it is God who works in you to will and act or work according to his good purpose. It's hard to do what Christ did in our day-to-day -day -day lives. It's hard to do it in the Christian community, and it's even harder to do it out there in the world. It's good to know that God is working in us so that we are able to do his will and to do his work. He is the energizing force that keeps us working and doing. He energizes us so that we can keep going and going. He is the one who empowers us to accomplish this. But we first have to let him work in us by making our will and his will the same. That's not changing his will to ours. That's changing our will to his. Are you working out your own salvation so that when no one else is around, so that when you don't have the strength and stability of your brothers and sisters there, that you still obey God at all times because Christ is your strength? Then you can help the Christian community as a whole work toward making their salvation complete. Man cannot do what only God can do, but God will not do what man must do. Salvation is God's responsibility. But we've got a little part in it too. We have to do our part. We have to be obedient to God. If the community is not what it should be, maybe it's because... I, you, we, each, every one of us, may, maybe we're not what each one of us ought to be. Maybe that's the problem. And so we need to work out our own salvation. And we need to do all things without grumbling or disputing that we might be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom we shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now often we pick up on that shining as lights part and forget the first part of that. We think of shining as lights in the world. That's what I want to do. But a lot of times we, we kind of forget about that first part. We don't realize that Paul is telling us how we shine his lights. Paul has built up to the ultimate example of Christ in unity, humility, and service. And now he's looking back at that. This is how you shine his lights. You be obedient. You be humble. You count others more significant than yourselves. And you don't do any of this grumbling and arguing.
Matthew 5, 14 through 16 records Jesus' teaching. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We do this. We shine as lights in the world by having the mind of Christ, by following His example of humble obedience, putting others first, and doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit without grumbling, arguing, or disputing. Now, reading the words grumbling and disputing, we might be reminded of children when parents tell them to do something and they, they grumble sometimes. And sometimes they argue with your parents over, over doing the thing. Paul wanted the Christians to know and to be more mature than that in obeying our Heavenly Father's instructions. The admonition, do all things without grumbling or disputing, it has general application. But in the context, it especially refers to the work we do for the Lord. Now, some who are active in the master's cause spoil their efforts by continually grumbling and complaining. How does God view our grumbling as we work for him? Well, imagine somebody gives you a gift, perhaps an impressive gift, and when they, they give it, they begin to complain about what it cost or how difficult it was to get and maybe how they kind of preferred to not get you anything. Well, what would you do with that? You'd probably say, keep your stinking old gift anyway. Now, try to imagine, if you will, How does the Lord feel when we grumble and complain while carrying out his divine directives? We should work willingly with a good attitude. I'm giving you the gift of salvation. Here's, what, here's all you need to do to, to receive it. Here's what you need to do. And we grumble and complain about it? Oftentimes we're giving a difficult task or one we don't even like. It's, it's not that it's difficult. It's that I don't want to do that. Well, sometimes we mumble and grumble. Sometimes we have the task given to us and we do it but we, we, we mumble, grumble and argue about it all the way to doing it, while we're doing it and even after we do it and we, we grab because we did it sometimes we grumble about the way life's treating us that's not the way a Christian does anything especially the work and will of God Instead of questioning life's mysteries and contradictions and God's uh, providences, saints with the mind of Christ pray as he did in Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will. All murmuring, grumbling, complaining, all is treason against the mind of Christ. It's a nasty habit of doing things with grumbling and argument. Remarkably good people can make their goodness remarkably unattractive. 
by the ungraciousness of their ways. On occasion, we, we might pay somebody to make repairs on the house or the car or the boat or whatever small engine we need repaired. And we want workers who, who are trustworthy, who are diligent and skilled, but we know very little about their personal lives. Many secular tasks can be done by godless people without their lack of spirituality affecting their work. But that's not true regarding spiritual tasks. Any defect of character mars the effort put forth in Jesus' name. If we're trying to advance the gospel, grumbling and arguing about it, if we're trying to do Christian good works for selfish ambition and, and out of conceit, if we're setting ourselves above others, that mars all of the work we're trying to do in the name of Jesus. David Roper tells this story. I remember the first time my father, a teacher of vocational agriculture, left me at Oklahoma at the Oklahoma State Fair in um, Oklahoma City. He had brought me and other students to the fair to stay with our animals until the, the contest, the judging, uh, for them to compete in their respective categories. And he left them at the fair several days while he returned to teach his classes. He would return before the contest, but as he prepared to leave, he pointed to his son's jacket, had rope or sewn, sewn into it. And he said, don't forget, that's my name too. His meaning was clear. It was understood. What his son did in his absence would not only reflect on him, but it would also reflect on his father. Even so, whatever we do reflects on our father. Either favor favorably or adversely. Therefore, we need to make sure that our public behavior, our Christian life, is above criticism. When we put on Christ, we are clothed in Christ. It's got Christ monogrammed right there. We're wearing His name. We're working in His name. We're living and doing in His name. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed by the wickedness that is rampant in today's world. We need to remind ourselves that the world has always been crooked and perverse. Pretty much. Except for that little short time there that, in the garden. We also need to remind ourselves that were the world not crooked and perverse then there wouldn't be a need for this little light of mine to shine. A lamp is not needed for light when the blazing sun is shining all around. The darker the world becomes, the greater the need for light, and the brighter those lights will shine. And that's how we shine as lights in this dark world, by being Christ-like. When the world is so opposed to Christ, those that are Christ-like, that are reflecting His light, can't help but shine. We stick out like a beacon, like a sore thumb. You hit it on everything. I, you hit your hand with the thumb with the end of the, uh, the end of the thumb with a hammer. I, you're gonna know where everything is in your house. I guarantee you, because you're gonna hit it on everything in your house. That's how we shine as lights. We're, we're that obvious. We're so countercultural in having the mind of, of Christ, in displaying His character, His attitude, that we can't help but shine. Verse 16 indicates that we shine as lights in the world by holding fast the word of life. It's not a light that's in ourselves. 
It's the message that we bear. It is the reflection of Christ in us. How do we hold fast or hold forth the word? By our lives and by our lips. What we do and what we say. And we can, we can picture someone clutching a torch. And in the context, the emphasis is on lighting the way for others. To help those in the world find their way. Holding fast can also be translated holding forth. And the two ideas are, are similar enough that they can be blended. We are to hold the light so securely that others can see to follow it. That which we are to grasp firmly is the word of life. It is God's word. It is the message of Christ and Him crucified. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hold that up so others can see a light too. That they might gain that light. You know, one light in a dark room sheds a little bit of light. Everybody in the room can see it. But you turn on another light, and another light, and another light. And you give somebody else the light. They have a light too. And pretty soon, darkness is dispelled. Because we have lit the world. In a quiet, peaceful, inoffensive manner, let there be no brawls, no strifes, no contentions. Paul is illustrating how the sentiment which he has just expressed about Christ, where he included the general duties of humbleness of mind, of esteeming others better than themselves, of, of doing all of that, having all of that Behavior of Christ, that mind of Christ, he's, Paul's illustrating how that is worked out. This is how we do it. Having this attitude. Doing this among those of perverted sentiment and bad habits. Those who are inclined to complain and find fault. Those who will take every occasion and every opportunity to pervert what you're doing in the name of Christ. And what you're saying, those who seek every opportunity to retard, push back, keep from growing the cause and truth of righteousness. Doing this in that environment, we can't help but shine as lights. We have the light. We need to stand in it, stand up for it, and hold it and present it to the world to let it shine forth. And when we grumble and dispute, we're putting a basket over our light. And if that continues, we're going to snuff it out. Are you working out your salvation to completion? What light shines from you? That's the question we need to ask ourselves every day. Am I a reflector? Is the light of Christ shining through me that this dark world might see what Christ is? Am I working out my salvation with fear and trembling, with reverence to God, not grumbling to or about my brothers and sisters? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. And make proper changes where they're needed. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord, if you have any need, if you'll come and make that known, we'll pray for you and we'll pray with you. If you come as together we stand and sing.